I'm here with Danny, assistant coach for the Atlanta Reign. And you guys had a bit of a season, right? Going to Hawaii yes. four or five times, making yeah. the grand final, pretty much being a, a menace to NA teams in the bracket <laughs> as well. Yeah, yes. In a year like this, can there be any regrets? Uh, I think there are like a few regrets that I have. I think early on in the season, something that we like kind of didn't really do that we change is that we didn't really like try to fit in our style. Like if you watched all our games at the beginning of the season, we were trying to mirror dive comps. We were just forcing dive, forcing dive, forcing dive. I think something that we really try to do is just find our own identity. And this is where we started running like the Arista comps, the Ryan comps, the Rush comps, things like that. I think really, it's really important for every single team to just focus on what they are best. Even if it's like a suboptimal comp, you can still win if you're good, if you can play together, if you trust together, everything like that. I think that's something that I a bit regret. But I think all our performances were really, really good this year. We saw a lot of teams leaning into their ability to play a certain style. Do you think that is something yeah. that is a testament to the balance of the game? Or do you think that was always possible in the history of Overwatch? I, I think that was really always possible in Overwatch. Like even if you see, if you watch matches from like Goat's Comp, you know Cheng Du is playing triple DPS. Even at one point, uh, Shanghai was almost beating uh, Shock with the triple DPS comp against Goats right before Rolock. So I think always playing to your strength is is like super, super, super important, and just not giving up, not tilting, just improving, seeing what's going wrong. Not always like, oh, this hero's trash. Let's just switch the comp. Let's just mirror these guys. No, we look at what's going wrong and let's how to how do we fix this? I think that's the most important thing for sure. Do you have an explanation then for this meta inertia that we saw in like season one and season two? <sighs> I, I'm not sure. Maybe it's just like players. I I don't really have like a really big explanation for it. I think Goats was like crazy strong though, especially with Brig after so many so many nerfs. It just it just became meta. Like, I think that's a balancing. But I think the current balance state was, like, really, really good. Like, during this playoffs, there were so many comps that you could run. I think it was really, really good. One of the first years this happened. Now, we are getting into a bit of a limbo state again with Overwatch 2, of course. We yes. don't know much about how the game will play. Theoretically, it could be vastly different. Is, yes. Is there, like, a gut feeling you have in terms of, like, how players might, for instance, transition from Overwatch 1 to Overwatch 2? Do you think that will be a problem, something like this? I don't know how many problems there, there will really be. I think removing a tank from the game allows like uh, supports to get shot at way more. It allows your DPS to carry a lot more. And I think ults in general, like just removing one person from the game, making a 4v5, like with an alt, like a sticky, like a tracer stick or something like that, is going to be very, very impactful. I think alts are going to be like really, really strong. I don't really have any like gut feeling, but I think removing a tank will definitely change the game for sure and how it's played. In order to build a team, one has to have some some system in terms of like being rigid towards yeah. um, meta issues or even, I mean, theoretically speaking, um, pretty wild changes that could theoretically occur, including like. Yes new tank heroes, we don't know what, what the situation will be in terms of new heroes yeah. coming in. How does one build a roster that is flexible or rigid to these impacts that we're about to face? Yeah, so I think something that uh, Atlanta does that's a bit different than every other team is that me and Brad, we really, really care about ranked. We want players that always play ranked every single day. They just grind, play the game, play the game, play the game. If you look at all our pickups this year, they play the game so much and they're exceptional. So I think when Overwatch 2 comes out, they're just going to grind the game. Whatever new hero, they will learn it. They will learn it fast and be good at the game. That's something that we have been trying to push for a couple years now. And I think that ranked is very important to be meta-proof. You guys, I remember in the preseason, we talked to Brad, and he talked about a minimum requirement of yeah. ranked games uh, over the, the Overwatch League season. Is this something you held up, or was it not possible due to like COVID? Uh, yeah, so we kind of stopped doing it once we started scrimming, but I think during the offseason, we held it pretty, like, pretty rigidly. Like Every week, we would just post how many hours of ranked someone was playing. And this is just to keep our team accountable and just not stop grinding before the off season. We don't want our players to come into the off season just like super uh, not aiming well, not playing well because they ha haven't been playing Overwatch. We want them to come into scrims on the first day of the season, and we want to start working right away. 
I think that's pretty important. I think my gut feeling is that Pelican would probably have the most hours played. Yes, yes. <laughs> What's he, the second he had a most? lot of hours. Second most? Uh, I think before the offseason, it was actually Hawk. I think oh. Hawk had a, a lot of games, yeah. But like even uh, throughout the season, like Pelican was streaming every single day. And I think that's something that everyone really, really respects. He was just getting rank one on like, th or he was getting top 10 on like three accounts every, every season. And I think that's something you can't teach a player. It's just their motivation. And that's just really important, in my opinion. Right. Now, I think theoretically, there is the, the threat of Overwatch 2 being so different that some won't transition extremely well or will more, need more time. And while playing the game a lot certainly helps to adapt, I guess there could be some reservations in terms of your general approach on staying lean. You guys yeah. once again decided on a seven-man roster. Why, why is that? Why does Atlanta um, like lean rosters? Yeah, so we kind of like the smaller roster, and it's just because we want to create like a family. Like we want to be really, really fun, honest with everyone. We don't want to be spending our scrim time just rotating. Oh, which player is going to play this week? We want to be like really open feedback. Like even our players that are going to be like um, on the bench, so like Gator or Hawk, they're going to be giving feedback every single scrim. They're going to be watching all our players every single time, and they're going to be honest. They're going to be talking about, oh, maybe we should try this instead. Like. I don't know. We want to create a team where the players on the bench, they're always involved. There are other coaches that help me and Brad. Like That's kind of the dynamic we want to help. We don't want to be wasting our time saying, oh, maybe we need to try this guy, this map, this guy, this map. And then there's like not very synergy. Our team is very, very like we want high chemistry between all our players, no matter what happens. Is that part of the decision why you guys decided to stay with a only English speaking roster this year? Uh, yeah, so for the most part, English speaking roster. Yeah, I think that's something that we also are doing because we're only doing me and Brad as the coaching staff. And we also unfortunately ha do not have our translator this year. Right. Now, there were some uh, Korean heavy hitters on the market. Theoretically, you guys could have yeah. competed for ya guys like Yaki. I mean, Ans was th apparently on the table. So is, is your idea and the the idea of having a cohesive roster stronger than whatever additional talent might have joined, Doreen? Yes, yeah, so I, I think the cohesiveness is like very, very important. I think that uh, all our pickups this year, like our personalities fit very, very well with the likes of like Gator, Hawk, Kai, me and Brad. Like we're really like a like a kind of fun team, things like that. I think sometimes these mixed, mixed rosters have a lot of like personality dynamics. Some people want to be very strict. Some people want like some kind of like VOD reviews, like three hour long VOD reviews, things like that. But we're pretty lenient, but at the same time, we're strict when it matters. And I think everyone on our team really fits that dynamic and is very open and things like that. Yeah. Right. Were you, it, it seems like a lot of teams are now competing for Western players. Were you very confident yeah. that you were going to get your top picks on, on those roles? In the yeah, I think especially after our performance this year, we were confident that we were going to get our picks. And I know for sure that we have a good reputation with all of the tier two teams. We've been scrimming Redbirds a lot. We've been scrimming everyone a lot. And I think we're all really good friends with like OG, Ultraviolet, everyone like that. Like we've known OG for a long time. And I think Atlanta is one of like the top prospects for uh, a lot of the new upcoming talent. Right. Just a fun team. Yeah. <laughs> now, Theoretically speaking, I mean, you guys ended up uh, picking up Ultraviolet and OG. It stands to reason that you guys could have maybe also tried your hand on someone like Sam instead of uh, going with Nero. Why was Nero chosen then in the end? Yeah, so I think Nero provides a, a lot of consistency. Like, I know he got a lot of slack last year for on the shock for, I don't know, maybe getting gapped a little bit. But I think he's like a very consistent player. He grinds the game so much. Like, if you look at his ranked hours he has like maybe 600 games like across every single role like this guy does not stop playing i think he's like very very consistent and he plays really well on like the flex dps heroes that we need such as farah may things like that where other flex dps players maybe aren't so good at may and fair i think nero just provides so much flexibility for us and he will learn any new hero that we need for overwatch 2. right now in terms of your backline yeah it seems like I mean, these guys were part of a team that pretty much dominated everything in their respective region. The problem with some of that is, is they are only used to winning for the most part. 
And we yeah. saw how that can backfire for a team like London Spitfire did last year, right? Are you guys confident that when, when it gets a little rougher and you guys might be, I don't know, playing some of the best teams, the Shock or whatever in the opener, that you can uh, keep the spirits high with those guys in your back line in Ultraviolet and OG? Yeah, I think that's something that we're going to need to work on a lot because maybe they're very young. They don't have like the leadership skills that we need to bring them up. And I think that's where our like more veteran players, such as Gator and Nier, come into play to like lift up the mood for everyone. I think, yeah, maybe OG and Ultraviolet, they don't have like the super high like leadership skills. Maybe they don't. They're, they're, they might get a little bit nervous playing against these like crazy, crazy high level like players. But I think us just being comfortable will remove all the nerves and we will do our best to make sure they're in high spirits no matter what happens. Now, when we talk to people doing the hiring in the, in the league, a lot of them like the idea of two flex supports. Some yeah. are even skeptical if a main support might be needed, but I'd picking up one just just to be safe <laughs> yeah yes was there ever an idea because you guys say you're done but you're currently only on one main support one flex support theoretically a guy like luino is in the, in the market why, why did you guys decide to not pick up a second flex support instead yeah so i think uh the synergy first of all between og and ultraviolet is just unmatched and i think also that if you look at what og plays in ranked he plays like a lot of like even the flex supports that we need such as, I don't know, maybe Ana, maybe BAP, like if it's BAP Zen, things like that. I don't think there will be any problems there at all. I think OG is very flexible on all the support heroes. And he also has a very, very good break, in my opinion. Is there any concern about the players? Because, okay, so a lot of people in the Overwatch League think this game will be a lot more mechanical, theoretically speaking, right? Yeah, yeah sure. And it might require more aim and whatnot, even possibly from tanks. We don't know what kind of tanks we might see in the future. Are you confident in the mechanical ability of everyone on your roster? Yes, 100%. I think our young players, their mechanical skill is unmatched. Even like, we haven't talked about Venom a little bit, but I think Venom's aim is just crazy. Like if you've ever watched his stream, this guy is just crazy. He has like crazy uh, rank stats as well with like stickies, a limbs, everything like that. Kevster level, like I'm very confident in Venom as well. But yeah, all our players' mechanical skill, I think, is going to be crazy, crazy high. Like, there's such a high ceiling that they can reach. There's so much potential. I assume, like, he has played on a, on a bunch of international rosters that he is fluent in, in English, right? Yeah, he's, uh, well, maybe not fluent for, like, conversation, but Overwatch level and, like, typing, for sure, 100%. Right. Um... I guess, overall, what would you think... What seeing like how the league builds and whatnot as well as the volatility expected with overwatch 2 what is your yeah. goal setting for next season is because theoretically <laughs> speaking the only way for you guys to improve is to win the thing right <laughs> yeah um i think our goal is always playoffs and just try to make a deep run i think if we all stick together we don't tilt we just have fun like we did every <laughs> like we did last year i think we can always make a deep run but yeah, I think just adjusting to the team or adjusting to the new game is going to be very important. I think all our players will play the game so much and we will learn so much together that anything that comes to hit us, we will be able to find a solution very quickly without like tilting or mental boom or anything like that. Yeah. Then we hope you will have a, a nice off season. Hope Overwatch yeah. 2 comes soon so you guys can start practicing. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and otherwise, uh, good break and good luck with your university co uh, courses. Yes. Yes, thank you.